Thank you, Kieran and Glenda. That was very interesting. Um, I, uh, I wonder if there might be, by the end of my presentation, some overlaps and, and, and areas where um, you know, there could be a sort of joint activity. Um, but I'm particularly focused today um, on optimising FM performance through the use of BIM technology. Um, come from, uh, well, sorry, I'll do a little introduction about me, about our project, Robin, and then um, just for fun, some myth busters at the end, which I, I can introduce separately as well, in case anyone isn't uh, familiar with the myth, myth buster concept. Um, BAM FM and BAM FM Ireland have been operating um, all together for about 15 years. Um, first of all, uh, to service the PFI sector in the UK and then later also in Ireland. Um, I've been with the company for all that time and uh, seen quite a lot of change. I'm strategic development director for BAM FM in the UK and I'm also a director of BAM FM Ireland. Um, as, as introduced, part of that role has seen me involved in some research and development projects, which is a reasonably rare thing in the FM sector, <laughs> just the way we are. Um, and one of our projects has been to pick up the, the work that contractors and design teams are doing with BIM and, and try and do something productive and useful with it uh, to optimise FM performance. Um, just a little bit more about BAM FM and BAM FM Ireland, what we're doing, um, which might give some context to why BIM and optimising FM performance could be important for us as well as for our client. Um, in the UK, 60% of our turnover is PFI driven, um, with 40%, the, the other 40% being largely hard FM service delivery from a mixture of static and mobile technicians and engineers. Uh, the PFI requires us to try and predict cost very early in a, in a design and development process. Uh, effectively, we have to fix a price before there's a single brick or anything laid in the ground. Um, so, so collaboration with the design team is a very important element in, in being able to fulfill that requirement. Once we have started delivering services, we have to be able to respond to problems very quickly within a rectification time. Otherwise, we can suffer deductions. Some might say punitive, but some might just say um, in, uh, enabling and invigorating to uh, make sure we deliver what we say we will. A third aspect is about the reduction of risk. Um, there's a lot of risk in PFI projects, some to do with energy and, and performance of the building. Again, that's an area where we have to focus um, at the design stages and then throughout the construction and the operation and managing risk. So we were interested to see what BIM could do to help us with that. And of course, there's the prediction of life cycle cost and replacement cost. From the point of view of mobile devices and, uh, sorry, mobile engineers and technicians, um, the industry is quite inefficient we find ourselves making multiple visits sometimes to fix individual problems because there has to be a visit to investigate, see what's needed. The engineer then disappears, goes and collects those parts either back from his office, workshop or from a supplier, arrives, has to arrive again and, and undertake the work. So a rectification can involve two or more visits um, and, and is inherently quite inefficient and it could be disruptive to a client as well. Um, Project Robin. I'll come back, I'll, I'll explain Project Robin's name in a moment. Just quickly, kind of putting the, the, the traditional kind of situation into context, um, I'm a wee bit colourblind, but I think the red line <laughs> is meant to be the client, the blue line, assuming that's not purple, is meant to be the contractor, building contractor, and the yellow or green line at the bottom. Uh, yellow, green, green, thank you. The green line is the FM contractor. So what we have is a situation where at the start of a project, the client knows everything. They know what they want and they've, they've developed a project. They select a contractor. The contractor absorbs all that information and develops more and more information of their own. And towards the end of construction, 
that information is retained by them. It's not handed over effectively to a separate FM contractor who's suddenly been appointed and appeared, doesn't really know much about the history of the project. But they, they'd run about wasting a lot of time and effort and money gathering new data, which nobody's really given them. It might be inaccurate, it might be wrong, who knows? Nobody really knows. Um, and there's a handover process. The FM contractor then starts to operate. And periodically through the operation, there are these fluctuations in information. New contractors might be appointed and not all the information gets handed over or transferred. The client becomes increasingly distant from the information and out of control of it. It's held by contractors. The cost of change is expensive because nobody really knows what's there. So every time you want to change something, you have to survey it first. The cost of life cycle is expensive because no one really quite knows what's where and what's what. So everything's remeasured all the time. Um, and and the, the cost effect of having inaccurate data just mounts up for the individual contractors themselves. In certain circumstances where a contractor is, or a, a service is retendered, a new contractor will arrive, do a survey, and tell the client there's a lot of information that wasn't on the original tender list, and the price goes up. So the client can be affected as well as the inefficiency in the FM sector. It's not an ideal, position, uh, an ideal situation. This bit here, I, I call that the BIM cliff, just so, uh, <laughs> so in an environment where BIM is being operated, but the FM contractor is not capable of picking up that data, then I call that the BIM cliff. All that data that's been gathered, whether it's traditional or in BIM, but if it's not picked up properly, it just falls away suddenly. And you can use the term BIM cliff, I give that to you. <laughs> I've, I've, I've been very proud of myself for months about that, but I don't hear anyone talking about it. Maybe Twitter it or something, that would be perfect, thank you. Um, so the, 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 um, the, the sort of objective of collaboration and, and the proper transfer of, of um, the BIM data, you, you see everything smoothed out. What we're talking about is early collaboration with a whole delivery team. So we have the design team, the contracting team, and the FM team involved in a design process where they can bring together the requirements, some of which are BIM data requirements. And again, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but as, as the project goes forward, the, the, the information and the data is shared. And it's not unusual in BAM um, for us. Uh, you know, We have a complete capability between BAM design BAM construction, BAM FM, we have the capability to um, share a lot of information. On our projects now, we're downloading BIM models every week or two weeks, and those are shared amongst the whole design team, sometimes up to 12 design and build subcontractors and the client. So everybody's seeing this data and everybody's um, being able to contribute and collaborate. So, Project Robin. Project Robin. Uh, was given its name um, at the time we had a series of projects we kept calling them after various types of bird and uh, it just so happened that we were set a deadline of Christmas so Project Robin became the uh, the name for this particular project and in retrospect I don't even know what Robins have to do with Christmas but it seems right <coughs> some red breasts and Christmas and I'm not quite sure how that <laughs> connects but um, it, it, it did Project Robin is sponsored by BAM FM. Um, we have uh, some partners in the in the project, um, principally Autodesk, um, who uh, supply, uh, supply a lot of um, software and support to BAM, um, including the Revit, their Revit software system, a product called Navisworks, and BIM 360 Field, which is a, a new project. Uh, sorry, a new product. Um, FSI are a CAFM, a Computer Aided Facilities Management Company. Um, they've been operating for about 20 years throughout the world um, and they supply BAM FM in UK and Ireland with our CAFM system. Now, a CAFM system incorporates a help desk, asset management systems, resource <coughs> management systems, very modular type systems hooked onto um, basically an, a, an asset list. Uh, which is, is, is in an, an SQL database, a relational database. Um, their products, Evolution, Go and Reach, which I'll come back to, um, were also 
enabling us to, to um, use BIM in this project. Um, finally, uh, an, another partner, and a very important partner in this, was BAM Design. Uh, BAM Design were responsible for providing the actual BIM models that we used to uh, introduce the, the um, systems that, that I'll describe in a moment. When we started Project Robin, we weren't even very sure whether or not we could transfer data from BIM to a CAFM system. That was the first question we had. Um, now, some of you might have heard of Kobe, and I'll, I'll come back to that um, in a moment. I can't even really remember what Kobe stands for. Construction something, building information exchange. Construction operation, building information exchange, maybe. Um, it came over from America, developed by their defense industry. Um, and it's an Excel format. It was, it was made in Excel format because that was seen as a comprehensive um, arrangement that anybody could receive and do something with. Um, it may be true, uh, but the data you get is kind of useless. Um, you have loads and loads and loads of tables and loads and loads of, loads of worksheets. Some of it looks up other bits, but actually to receive that information doesn't really leave you any are much better informed than you probably were. Um, and if, as a client, you received a memory stick with a Kobe file on it, um, I'm promising you, you wouldn't really be able to do very much with that. Um, probably put it in a, actually, do you know what you would do? You'd probably just delete the file and use some holiday photos you know, on, the, on the memory stick, take that about and show your family. Um, so it wasn't a big leap forward. The, the Revit system that we operate within BAM is our SQL database. That, that's the basis of it. Uh, the CAFM system we have an SQL database, so it made far more sense uh, to actually have an XML data transfer, a, a, a database type file transfer between two databases than go into Excel. And if, if there was one big bit of first learning that we had, it's that Kobe's a bit of a waste of time. Um, and actually, uh, this XML type of file transfer is much more interesting, much more useful, and it maintains the relationships between individual assets and the systems that they sit in. And that, that's quite an important thing to be able to transfer from the, the construction team. Um, when we did phase one, we, we took some data from uh, a Revit model. We cleansed it a little bit because it can, the data itself can be a bit messy between what's logged and what fields and how assets are coded. So we cleansed it a little bit and we transferred it into the CAFM system, the uh, evolution system provided by FSI. That, that was reasonably interesting. It doesn't sound it, but it was reasonably interesting because quite a lot of errors came back. And the reason for those errors, um, whilst we tried to map and kind of see the problems coming, but. What, what, what we have in, in the construction world is very different terminology and tagging of assets to what we have in the FM world. So in the FM world, we talk about rooms and we talk about walls and floors. And in, in the construction world and design world, we talk about surfaces and spaces. Those are just examples of, of the, the types of terminology that, that, that the databases couldn't quite reflect in one another. So the mapping became a little bit more complex. We had another go at it and we successfully transferred a cleansed BIM model into the CAFM system. And we thought, whoa, that's wonderful. Haven't we done well? And in some respects, we, we kind of saw that as being, that was the big thing. The thing was to overcome that, apart from being collaborative, but the thing was to overcome that first upload of data into the CAFM system, that, that BIM clip. So we were going to give ourselves a pat on the back, and then it seemed a bit too easy. Uh, and we thought, well, we've still got this 3D environment, this 3D representation of, of the building. And presumably, there's something we can also do with that. So we, we pushed on into phase two. Phase two would have been the first bullet on its own, which would have been, instead of cleanse data, a real live data transfer. But um, we added the next two bullets onto it. So in phase two, we had a project in Camden, 
um, it's called UCL Academy. It's one of the new BSF academies, very shiny, very lovely school, fantastic thing. Um, it had been operating, well, it has been operating now for about 12 months. There was some parts of a BIM model, a 3D Revit model, but the M&E systems hadn't been designed and the as-fitted drawings weren't in 3D. Um, they were in uh, CAD duct and, and systems like that. So we invested some time and effort with BAM Design to bring all those items up to a 3D BIM model standard and we started asset tagging. Now you'll remember one of the things I mentioned was about the collaboration of, of FM at the start. Make sure I don't come back to this here. Um, and what was very important was for us to make sure that the, uh, that the, the assets were being tagged correctly to suit our asset management system. So for any future projects and for our purposes, we've established um, protocols that we can share with design teams nice and early to structure and manage and tag assets, including uni-class codes, um, in, in a sensible way so that when we get to that handover stage, the data can be handed over and mapped and then utilized in a, in a managed useful and efficient way. Different clients might have different asset structures and individually design teams and either clients or FM contractors will have to, I suppose, adjust and, and double check or consider um, how they want things tagged and, th and assets structured. Um, that was uh, another interesting development for us. It forced us to think about something we hadn't really thought about. But it also will force everybody who wants to do this kind of BIM work in operations to, to, to have that discussion as early in the design process as you can. Because once, once that design process has started and the assets have started falling into place, it's quite hard to undo it all without becoming quite inefficient at some point down that, that um, project line. I'll speed up a bit. Um, the uh, the 3D BIM environment, you know, we thought that, that's really interesting and it's too good to waste. Um, so we thought well, the Revit model itself is an enormous thing, you know, it's often giga gigabytes and it's not very easy to, to operate um, from a handheld device or whatever. Autodesk came to us with a new product they have called BIM 360 Field. BIM 360 Field is a, a product which um, operates on, say, a tablet, normally an iPad if it's an Autodesk product. It synchronizes with the Revit model every time you, you go to recharge it. And, and it provides us the ability to um, investigate spaces that visually you can't see. So we thought maybe there's 12 fan call units in the room. Using the, uh, the BIM model on a handheld device, you can turn off ceilings, turn off floors, turn off walls, and just see the services. So you can pinpoint where a fan call unit is and by touching the screen, just like you would in the Revit model, you can get metrics for that item. You can find out what it is, you can find out who made it, when it was last maintained, you can find out um, commission flow rates, things like that. The advantage with that is that um, you can go straight to an asset rather than hunting around to find the thing. You can also find what that's connected to in terms of its system and I'll, I'll give you an example of that in a moment. And rather than have to disappear away off and find lots of O&M manuals to do some of that work and then find commissioning data to find out what, what that unit's meant to be doing, its flow rate maybe, you can actually have all that on the screen in your hand while you're in the room. So we're talking about faster first fix. Just the last point there as well, uh, I said I would mention Go and Reach. Um, the FSI products that we are using with Evolution also have a handheld device capability. So when we receive a call to a help desk that maybe says the room's a bit cold or hot, whatever, that call is directed straight to a handheld device, which is, is held by a technician or an engineer. The technician or the engineer can pick up that device and link the room into the BIM model. So you pick up the call, the, the, the job sheet, if you like, on the screen. And 
simply connect from the room reference into that room, a view of that room in the 3D environment, then allowing him, he or she to remove the ceilings, remove the floors, whatever, and see what's in that room. So even a mobile engineer receiving a call, if they're in their van or back in an office, they haven't even left yet, they can, they can have a look at that room, have a look at the equipment in that room before they've left, and there's the potential to bring with them um, pulley belts for fans, filter, media for the, the right fan coil units, whatever. The, the, the chance being that they will be able to fix it the first time they visit, rather than almost by necessity having to go away again because they're not really quite sure what was in the room. They can go straight to pinpoint a problem as well with minimal disruption. Um, so that was about the synchronisation of the CAFM system with the BIM environment on the one device. This is a wee, just a wee process between the synchronisation of the systems and the, the sort of maturity of the BIM in the operational environment. So we start off down at the bottom left with the 3D model. We've been able then to look at the data spec for the FM and the, the FM data that we're most interested in. Just a, another comment about Kobe. Some of the Kobe stuff, if you, if you really follow the letter of the law, there's about 100 pieces of data for a door. And from the FM industry, I'm telling you, that's probably 90 too many. Um, we don't need all that data. And again, early on in a project, we, we can tell you the stuff we're most interested in. There might be lots of other stuff other people are interested in, but from an FM point of view, there's only so much data that's really useful and interesting to us. So again, from an efficiency point of view, for our whole design team, th there may be, may be able to streamline some of that data requirement. Um, we, we did our, our Kobe drop there. Because we're using XML, we, we're now calling it Kobe Plus. I don't know whether uh, that makes any sense to anyone, but it's, it's not an Excel data drop. Um, we configured the CAFM system to receive the Kobe and then actually transferred Kobe into the CAFM system using the mapping arrangement that we had developed. Uh, the hardware con configured for the BIM and CAFM systems referring to the mo mobile devices, um, iPads in our case, uh, loaded up with the BIM 360 field and the FSI Go products. The FM team was trained on site to, to use both those products. Plus, for the purpose of this study at Robin, we've got a year's data um, on our actual operation without the BIM and without the handheld devices. And we've started in the last two weeks now using the devices and measuring the, the, the benefits in terms of our performance. We've got a lot of performance standards that we monitor, so we're able to continue to monitor them and check the improvement in service levels. There's not a huge amount to report yet, but maybe if you invite me back in a few months, I'll give you some real tangible improvements and, and demonstration. Um, we also, for the sake of knowing that you know, a school that's one year old and two years old has a variety of maybe different types of problem will come to us from year one to year two. So we're also comparing it against uh, another BSF school of a similar size and similar age, which isn't operating the system yet. Plus, we've given our technicians and engineers uh, an online questionnaire. Uh, so every time they finish a job, they're asked very briefly to um, estimate the time they saved using the handheld devices and the BIM model rather than having to go disappear down into the boiler room, find the O&M manuals, about 16 volumes of them, and, and get the data they needed. So combining all this, we're, we're going to establish you know, the real efficiencies and the benefits. So BIM is in use for FM at, at uh, UCL Academy, and the interesting one at the end there is about updating the BIM. Um, the Revit model has to be kept live. That's not a big leap for BAM. Most of our contracts, that 60% of the PFI without question, require us to maintain all the building information up to date anyway. So to keep a Revit model up to date, that's no big shake. Now out in industry, outside of the PFI world, that might be a slightly harder task and a harder sell um, to have FM contractors do or procure Revit updates. Um, it, the, the, the issue or the, the problem there can be softened 
because the 360 field environment that I'm describing um, is like a buffer. So the, 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 the Revit model, which is all super duper and mega gigabytes of it out there in whatever it is in the cloud or in a server or somewhere, to change that, you know, you're looking at bringing in a technician and, and doing a piece of work. Um, however, the data that comes from it goes through the 360 field. So using the handheld devices, we can update information on individual assets. We can add data to individual assets in the 360 field from the handheld device. And that sits in a buffer kind of zone before the, the, the Revit model. So every time you pull data back at the Revit, when it's coming through the 360 field, it picks up those other pieces of data that we've added and you get a complete picture. So we don't always have to update the Revit model and the Revit data. You can actually use the 360 field as a buffer, if you like, um, quite a manageable and you know, virtually free buffer uh, for gathering or pushing data up and, and pulling it back down. So very quickly, faster first fix. This is on the right hand, uh, left hand side, sorry, the UCL Academy, just a, a zoomed out um, view of it. This is actually the handheld device. You can see it says Robin UCL up at the top. So this is the, the, the um, environment that the, the 3D virtual environment that our technicians are using. And down at the bottom, you can see that's the BIM 360 field software product on the iPad. On the right hand side, we've gone into a, an individual room and we've turned off the ceilings. Um, there's nothing very exciting up there, but there's some pipe work, um, some sprinkler heads, some extract uh, ducts. Assuming there was maybe a heating problem in here, we're trying to trace a problem through the heating system, we can identify one of those pipes and take it down into the, the ground floor boiler room. Now for a mobile technician, that's, that's a bit of a leap. A mobile technician would ha wouldn't really be sure where those pipes are going to go, where the boiler room was. BIM 360 can take him straight to it. So we've then found these two uh, duty and standby pumps here. By touching the pumps, metrics have come up about those pumps. So we know various details about the type of controller, the power they're using, their set points, this kind of thing. Um, that information can be adapted for individual assets. So for your handling unit, you can get um, uh, you can get the, the filter media size and spec. You can get fan belts size and spec. You can have different data for different types of assets throughout the building: doors, carpets, walls, light fittings, all sorts. Um, you can set that up differently. So you can see here how, how tangible that information is and how quickly problems can be uh, investigated and rectified, even without necessarily being in the building. Another thing we can do is identify on the screen whether there's health and safety requirements to be taken into account before you touch any particular asset, whether a permit to work is required, and go straight to a link to a permit, the, per the specific permit to work system here and straight to the authorising engineers, competent engineers or, or people that are authorised to sign off a permit. So the system becomes very much more um, intuitive and safe as well. Phase three for us will start in 2013. And what we're looking to do is pick up live BMS data. And this is maybe where we're starting to uh, overlap a little bit with the, the previous presentation. What, what we're looking to do um, is to bring into the 360 field image for any individual asset that has measurement on it from the BMS, the live um, flow, uh, whether that be water or air, or just the different BMS metrics, whether the item's on or off even. Um, so if we can incorporate that visually somehow into the, into the, um, the, the screen, that will also be um, very helpful and informative to engineers rather than have to stick a manometer in a duct above the ceiling and all this stuff. Um, we're also looking to increase the amount of synchronization between the BIM data and, um, say, uh, automatic meters, like the 44 meters you were mentioning. If we can be gathering, if you like, um, dashboards almost, uh, using the BIM environment to create a lot of metrics, then it's uh, sort of verging on the big data for FM uh, could be very interesting. And also business data could be incorporated into that to client business data. So that's the kind of direction of travel for us, um, very much enabled by the, um, 
the BIM environment. So Mythbusters, very quickly, five minutes on Mythbusters. Mythbusters is an American program. I don't my kids are dad for it. Um, they, uh, they sort of test myths. They fire guns at, or yeah, they fire guns at people and see if they'll kill them or something. And they, they fire arrows from a distance and see if it will go through the armour of a king that apparently died at a certain distance from a single arrow blow, you know, this kind of thing. And it's, it's um, lots of bravado and things blowing up. Um, nothing will blow up today. Um, first of all, I'm going to bust a myth. So myth one, BIM is only for new facilities. We say no. Um, BIM, of course, the collaboration and the involvement of BIM can be enabled hugely in new facilities. If, if um, you know, that, that collaboration starts early, the benefits are there to be recognised, no doubt about it. And, and it's a fantastic opportunity for FM and the client and probably for the, uh, the, the contractors and the design team as well to, to collaborate and be efficient. However, um, Camden UCL, we, we were keen to get a BIM product, product or project uh, in fast development. And rather than wait on our current 3D BIM project to um, fulfil its potential or, or to be completed a year from now, um, we, we actually went backwards and completed a BIM model for a building that was already in operation. So by its very nature, we've done existing estate already. We're looking to do more of this. And what's quite interesting about that is using point cloud surveys, we can, we can survey all the internal surfaces and external surfaces of a building in a, in a day or two. It's very cheap, very easy. Um, uses quite a lot of data, but it's very cheap and very easy. And we can then load up just the things that FM, maybe the client and FM, are interested in. Um, and we can consider the tolerances. You know, not, it doesn't have to be millimetre perfect. It just has to be enough, enough to make this efficient for us. So th these are areas where we're, we're going to turn some attention to as well. Um, back to the future BIM, I call it there a bit cheekily. Um, one, one project north of Leeds, uh, uh, a medium-sized hospital, is, uh, is uh, so on our target list. It's about eight years old. There is uh, there's some CAD drawings for it, but we're intending to introduce that into a uh, or introduce a, a Revit 3D model to that. Um, myth two, Kobe. I've already talked about Kobe and had a bit of a moan. Kobe's very good. I think Kobe is a term. People understand what's intended by Kobe, but Kobe is an Excel format. Is really, it's really no use to anyone, and um, there's nothing you can do with it. Someone in um, you know, one of these blog type things referred to it as a wrench to bang um, a, a nail into a, it's like a wrench instead of a hammer, you know, to bang a nail into a desk or something. It's just not the right tool for the job. Um, it's a good tool, but it's not the right tool for the job, and it's very difficult to harvest the data from it to make it useful. So um, there's a, a lesson there. Um, what is the right tool might still vary from one project to another, depending on the software products that the design team and the contractors are going to use. And it might vary with the type of asset data that the client or the FM operator want to use. But for us, so far, Kobe isn't it. Myth three, design uh, team inputs um, are sufficient uh, for Kobe and for FM purposes. They may be. Some of them might be useful, but my example of the door is, is a lot of them are, are, are not terribly interesting to us, um, the superfluous, really. Um, they might be useful during the construction phase, so you know if they're collected for that purpose, that's fine. Um, but the key items for us are really about um, commissioning. It's the more data you get later on, it's the most interesting stuff. Lots of stuff about commissioning. Um, uh, so sort of the unit class codes for different items is all is all very important to us. Um, the, the the there's examples of windows and they've got kind of identifiers on the top corner and the bottom corner about where they are um, positioned in the world. You know, it's kind of latitude and longitude things. FM don't need that. If there's a broken window, we'll find it. We don't need its latitude and longitude and a GPS signal or anything like that. We can find a broken window. So there's a lot of data that, that is superfluous. And, and again, the efficiency of the whole process could be enabled a lot by early collaboration. And the benefits of harmonization of software is an interesting one. We, we hear a lot of design teams 
almost selecting themselves because they're all Revit operators, say, or Archibus operators. And that, 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 that's an interesting thing, and it's probably the right intent to start. But actually, again, from an FM point of view, the data we tend to be harvesting, I'll use that word again, doesn't necessarily come from Revit or Autodesk, but it will come from a collaborative model, um, probably which has been contributed by 12 or more subcontractors. So the Steelworks subcontractor might not be using that same software. The M&E contractor might not be using that same software. There may be several other subcontractors, equipment suppliers, using different software that is incorporated in the 3D BIM model, but it's not Revit and it's not Archibus and it's not none of those things. So some of the, this, sort of the, the discussions that design teams are having about we'll all work in a certain product um, become less relevant as um, the supply chain and, and the contractor uh, become involved. And that, that, that's an interesting thing just to consider. Uh, myth four, we're almost there, second last one. Um, as fitted, an O&M manuals are here to stay. Um, I, I see a day um, for at least medium to large size projects where actually um, that, all that paper is in the past and what, what the, hand, the handover will be um, a lot softer. It won't just be ha sort of the issue of a memory stick or something like that. It's because of the collaboration that we're, we're talking about here, the handover will be phased through a number of Kobe drops, Kobe plus drops culminating in a final Kobe Plus drop and, and a, a sort of a, absorbing the Revit model into the operational phase rather than a, a, a handover of lots of drawings and, and everybody running off into the sunset. And finally, BIM is an IT project. IT is very much an enabler, but actually BIM has been more for us about people and collaboration than it has anything else. And um, you know, the, the, the fact that we've transferred some data over in an XML format, that's not revolutionary. The fact that we're keeping a, a, a 3D Revit and BIM 360 field system operating, the construction industry is already operating in that, that environment, so that's not revolutionary. Bringing it together and using it, having people actually use it and commit to it and collaborate through a design process and into an operation process, that's really where the, the benefits of BIM lie. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I think we'll take questions at the end. Okay.